were to ask you, is it noisy where you live? You'd probably laugh at me. <laughs> you would probably say, boy, I live in Montana, or perhaps Wyoming. And it's true that this place we call the last best place may very well be the last quiet place. I bet if you live here, you probably can't remember the last time somebody honked a horn at you in traffic. Yeah, what's traffic? Not long ago, one evening shortly before Christmas, I was driving down 17th Street West, and I saw an eight-point mule deer buck, which my daughter insisted was a reindeer, <laughs> strolling along down the street alongside Rocky Mountain College. I live in a city of 100,000 people that's too quiet to scare away the deer. <laughs> and yet, like many idea-oriented people, like you perhaps, I spend a lot of time inside my own head. You do that? And I've discovered that's a very noisy place. <laughs> now, when I speak of noise in my own head, or, or voices in your head, I am not making light of auditory hallucinations. I have a family member who experiences those. And I'm not making light of mental health. It's a serious topic. What I'm talking about is the voices we all hear, the messages we've internalized over the course of our lives that we play back. And they may be as innocuous as your mother telling you to eat your vegetables, or your grandparents telling you all the lessons they learned from the, from the hard times they suffered through, or your, your best friend saying, I told you he was too good for you, <laughs> or you were too good for him. <laughs> Got to get that one right. <laughs> those messages. Those voices can also say very hurtful things, like, you'll never be good enough. You're not worthy. Or, my personal favorite, what's going to happen when they figure out you're not as smart as they think you are? Hmm. These messages that we collect over the course of our lives and play back in our own heads, we make a choice about it, subconsciously or not, of which ones to play back. And that choice can have a huge effect on our, on our mood, on our productivity, even on our very sense of self-worth. And it's a choice that most people don't pay enough attention to. When I worked in broadcast engineering, there was a concept I used almost every day that we called the signal-to-noise ratio. Now, in a nutshell, any message you're trying to get through a channel is the signal. Everything else is the noise. And my premise today is that we live way too much of our lives with our heads buried in the noise. You see, the signal's the good stuff. The signal, in this respect, is, is only those messages that contribute to a positive sense of self-worth, the kinds of things that help us become loving, productive, rational human beings. And the noise, everything else. Whether it's the, the chattering monkeys in our brain, or the messages of what might have been, the what ifs, the if onlys, the put downs, all of that is the noise. And our job is to filter out the noise and not live our lives in it. Now, does that sound like something that might help you to understand how to, in engineering terms, optimize your internal signal to noise ratio? Well, before I, before I go further, I'm going to tell you that there are three techniques that you can pick up from me today. Because this sounds difficult, this whole optimizing your signal-noise ratio thing. But it really isn't. Yes, it requires perhaps changing some habits of thinking and behaving, but there are three techniques I'm going to share with you that will help you do that. Does that sound like a good idea? <coughs> Before I introduce the first technique, though, I want to introduce a book that I highly recommend called Made to Stick, Why Some Ideas Survive and Others Die by the brothers Chip and Dan Heath. If you're at all interested in creativity or the life of the mind, I urge you to read this book. Now, one of the illustrations that Chip and Dan Heath use in this book comes from a study that was performed in the early 1990s on some students at UCLA, a study in problem solving. And what they did was they divided these students into groups. And one group was told, as they were trying to solve this problem in their personal lives, they were told to visualize the future with that problem solved. Another group was told to visualize in their minds all of the things that had already happened that led up to being in the problem that they were in. In short, one group was asked to focus on the future, and the other was asked to focus on the past. Now, you might think, with all the emphasis we have these days on visualizing our future, that this group would have done better. 
it turns out that the future-oriented group did worse on almost every measure of managing their problems. And the group that did better was the one that was focusing on what had already happened. Now, the authors believe that's because by focusing on the actual events that led to being stuck in the problem they were in, these people were priming their brains to see, so to speak, the path out of the woods. And yet there's something about that result that just doesn't seem right, isn't there? Doesn't it seem counterintuitive that focusing on the past is going to move us past our problem? And why is that? It's because of those tapes. It's because when we focus on the past, what do we do? We replay the tapes. We replay the scenes in our mind of what happened right up to the point where we do what? We want to change it. Right up to the point where we wish that scene had gone differently. Right up to the if only point. If only I had done this instead of that. If only she had or they had. If only my plan had worked. If only my lottery ticket had hit one more number. And we get stuck there, savoring that, that scene that we're trying to change in our mind instead of moving past it. Well, the first technique is how we get rid of the if-only noise in our mind. And I call it assess without obsessing. Here's how it works. As you're playing back those tapes and you're looking at what has already happened to get you to the point where you're stuck, when you reach that scene, that crucial scene that you want to change, write it down. Write it down in your journal, or just on a piece of paper if you don't journal, or on one of these neat little notebooks you got today. Write it down, and then look at it, and say, can I change it? Say that out loud. Ask yourself that question. Can I change it? And then hear yourself answer, no. There's value in hearing yourself ask and answer that question. Then ask the next all-important question, what have I learned from it? You see, that's the question that's going to prime your neural pathways to start seeing the solutions. And those solutions are the signal. And you've just increased your solutions and reduced the noise of if only. Congratulations, you have just increased your signal to noise ratio. <laughs> that's step one. Now, step one is primarily an intellectual exercise. It has to do with thinking about events that have happened. But you know, there's an emotional component to this as well. We know that just the intellectual side won't work by itself. We know, in fact, that it's one thing to say, assess without obsessing. But if you're truly obsessing over something, you can't just let go of it and walk away, can you? There's an emotional component, emotional noise. And that's where step two comes in. About a dozen years ago, I experienced a huge failure in my professional life. I got in over my head managing a project that I did not have the resources to take control over. And the result was a lot of hard feelings and a lot of, it cost the company I was working for a lot of money. And in the aftermath of understanding, coming to understand what had happened, one of the very painful things for me emotionally was coming to terms with this loss of my self-image. I had to stop thinking of myself as infallible. And that was not easy. And the trouble was, I couldn't just let go of that and walk away because I didn't have another self-image to replace it with. And so I clung to this failed self-image. I walked around with unresolved grief over the loss of my old self-image. And as you may well know, unresolved grief turns into what? Depression. Big time. It was about a year before I was functional again. And I still struggle with depression. It was not until I sought forgiveness of the people I had hurt and forgive them for their part in it that I was able to begin moving back into being functional. Forgiveness is key. And of course, I had to forgive myself. And by forgiveness, I don't mean just what seems easy of saying, I forgive you. And I don't mean forget. Forget and forgive are two completely different things. What I mean is to understand and fully embrace at an emotional level Anne Lamott's definition of forgiveness. Forgiveness means to let go of all hope of having had a better past. You have to let yourself grieve 
what you can't change and have to walk away from. And that's why step two is grieve it and leave it. You've got to do the emotional work. If you can't change it, you have to let yourself process emotionally what it is that you've let go. Because when you let go of something, you don't have it anymore. And you have to grieve that loss. If you do, you can move on. If you don't, you're still going to be stuck. It's that simple. Now, steps one and two are both about dealing with the past, processing it on an intellectual level and, and an emotional level. Before I introduce step three, I want you to ask yourself a question. What kinds of noise stand between you and your ideal future? I know the answer for me. The noise that stands between me and my ideal future is the noise of self-doubt and self-criticism. Those are my biggies. Those are the reason I have not yet achieved my potential. And I'm working through them. I am learning how to filter them and improve my signal noise ratio where that, where that comes, where that comes in. And one way I'm able to filter that is by remembering a lesson that I learned about 15 years ago on top of a mountain in Colorado. Now at this time, my work involved linking up some communication sites that were up on the mountains in Colorado. And I wanted to prove my competence. I wanted to prove how capable I was at managing the project I was assigned to at the time. So I was going to advance the schedule. I was going to work ahead of the deadlines. I was ready to go and perform the all-important site survey involving one location in this project that was located at 12,000 feet elevation high on Mount Baldy just outside Breckenridge, Colorado, on the side of the valley opposite the ski runs. It was late June, and I had decided the time had come to pick up our client's representative and drive up to this particular communication shack that sat at 12,000 feet and look at what we needed to do up there. Now, my boss was skeptical about this plan. Back in Denver, he told me, David, I've been working in these mountains a long time, and in my experience, a road like that won't be passable, won't be free of snow until after the 4th of July, which is still a couple of weeks away. John, not to worry. I've got this. I was in Breckenridge just last weekend with my family, and I scoped out Mount Baldy with my 10 by 50 binoculars, and I can tell you it is snow-free to above Timberline. And besides that, that F-350 pickup has four-wheel drive and a big old bumper winch. How hard can it be? <laughs> so he let me go. Now, he was right to raise the question about my experience, because he knew I was only in my second year of living in Colorado, having moved there from Texas. I didn't have a lot of experience working in the mountains. I wasn't even fully acclimated to, the, to Colorado's elevation yet. <coughs> but I was going to prove my competence and advance that project forward on my schedule. So I drove to Breckenridge. I picked up the client's representative, a fellow I'll call Dan the Mountain Man. And we started driving up the Forest Service Road that goes up past the old mine shafts and up to the communication shacks on the shoulder of Mount Baldy. And sure enough, at the last switch back before Timberline, it was still snowed in. And winch or not, there was no safe way around it. Now, that's where my self-criticism kicked in. David, you are so stupid. How could you possibly think you knew more about this than your boss? Why didn't you listen to him? I started beating myself up inside. I turned, I looked at Dan, and he had a big grin on his face. He said, it's a beautiful day for a walk. We got out of the truck. We climbed over the snowbank, and we started walking up the road. And after a couple of minutes, Dan said, you know, if we follow this road, it's going to take about a mile and a half to get to that communication site. But if we just go right up this slope here, it's only half a mile away. <laughs> and a 500-foot climb. Uh -huh. Did I mention he lived at 10,000 feet? <laughs> <laughs> and until a year before, I had lived at 500 feet most of my life? Did I mention he had snowshoed up to this site before? Well, I knew I couldn't match his pace, but we started up the slope. And it was a beautiful June day, and, and there was springy tundra underfoot. I remember watching all these lovely little yellow and purple flowers go by as I stared at my feet, trudging up this hillside, thinking I am wasting this man's time. Of course, I couldn't match his pace, but he was patiently waiting for me. And before long, I looked like this. <sighs> One step, a deep breath. One step, 
two deep breaths. And the more out of breath I got up there at nearly 12,000 feet, the, the louder the noise in my head, the more the self-criticism, the more the voices were saying, oh, you wanted to demonstrate how capable and competent you were, you can't even walk up a mountain. And you know, you wouldn't be in this situation if you just listened to the people who knew more than you did. Oh, you're so capable and competent. And the higher I went up the mountain, the lower my mood sank. Until finally, about the 20th time that I stopped to catch my breath, Dan said something that made all that noise go away. You know what he said? Can you believe we're getting paid to do this? <laughs> <laughs> and I stood up, I looked around, and I was in the middle of some of the most gorgeous countryside in all of North America. And I'm not sliding my adopted state of Montana when I say this. I was above Timberline in the middle of the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, and coming into view over one ridge was the Mount of the Holy Cross, and all around me were a dozen 14,000-foot peaks that it looked like you could just reach out and touch. I was surrounded by some of the most gorgeous scenery in North America from a vantage point that very few people got to enjoy in the course of their work day, and my self-talk was all about how incompetent I was because we were walking and not driving. Now that, my friends, is noise. <laughs> Till what happened? I took a clue from outside my head, from something he said, that refocused my attention on where I was, what I was doing, and who I was with. And in doing that, I greatly increased my signal-to-noise ratio, because I left behind all those critics that I had chosen to carry up the mountain inside my head. Now, are you picking up on those clues, or are you missing them? Are you tuning in, which is step three in the process, to information about who you are and about what you're worth? Or, like I was at the time, are you letting your, your self-image get buried in the noise? Now, let me just ask you this. Of all the ideas and the phrases you've heard me throw out today, can you name one that's going to stay with you? What have you heard me say today that's something you think that you're going to remember and take with you when you leave here today? Just shout it out right now. Breathe it and leave it. Breathe it and leave it. Yeah. Success, success These are all great ideas. I tell you what, get ready to write down a web address you'll see up here in a minute when I finish if you'd like to hear more of them. But before I finish, I've got to tell you about this little piece of paper that I keep taped to my computer monitor. It's a fortune from a fortune cookie, and it says, someone is speaking well of you. I keep it there to remind myself to engage in step three of the process, tune in. Tune in to information about who I am and what I'm worth. And I assure you that if you will use these three steps, one of these days when the noise subsides, the person who is speaking well of you will be you. Mm -hmm.